You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to the Open Door. Jim Hannock here with co-host Mario Ramos Reyes. Today we discuss the work of the Association of Hebrew Catholics. Once again, our special guest is Professor Lawrence Feingold of Kenrick Glennon Seminary. Professor Feingold is an active member of the Association of Hebrew Catholics. As always, let's begin in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you will renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful. In the same spirit, help us to relish what is right and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me begin this morning with a... Uh, critical context question. Uh, Professor Feingold, can you please help us understand the significance of Vatican Council II's Nostra Aetate? Yeah, great question. So um, one of the documents of the Second Vatican Council is um, the Declaration on the Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions, called Nostra Aetate, and it um, deals with um, other non-Christian religions in general. But the, from my point of view, and I think in terms of the consequences and effects of the council, the fourth chapter on um, relations with the Jewish people has been very, very important um, in the life of the church in the last 50 years. Um, and so that fourth chapter um, speaks about the spiritual ties that tie together the people of the new covenant to the um, the people of the old Abraham's stock, and um, a key point that the Nostra Aetate makes is that um, simply call and I'll talk about that in a minute. It quotes um, the letter to the Romans, chapter eleven, verse twenty nine, which speaks of God's calling as irrevocable, and therefore the election of the chosen people hasn't been abrogated or done away with. Um, and so the chosen people are still the chosen people. Um, and now that's it's a truth of Scripture, but the fact that um, an ecumenical council called that to mind um, shortly, uh, 20 years after the Holocaust, the Shoah, um, was of great importance and continues to be of great importance in um, clarifying the relationship of the Catholic Church to the Jewish people. That it's not, it can't be conceived in the way that many theologians in the past conceived it, simply with the idea that the church has replaced Israel as the chosen people. And then that often that goes by the name of supersessionism, the idea that um, there's been a, um, a replacement of the people of God, and thus the Jewish people would no longer have any um, special status, no longer be chosen. And the, the council basically makes it um, impossible for Catholics um, to hold that, um, and that has been continued to be developed by um, John Paul II and, and uh, Pope Benedict and Pope Francis since the Council. Um, and then the second thing that um, it just simply calls to mind again something obvious, but um, in the past anti-Semitism has been fueled by the idea of that the Jewish people was a deicide people, right? And that I mean, so for example, my grandmother. Was, uh, so my, um, on my father's side, my, my dad was Jewish atheist, and his um, parents, my grandparents, came from um, Belarus, my grandma, and uh, Lithuania, my grandpa. And my grandma would tell me that when, among her earliest memories were um, hearing the shouts of Christ killer, um, particularly on Sundays. Um, and they were in fear that their village, their Jewish village, would be um, vandalized um, on that occasion. So the, the Second Vatican Council just simply says that um, in no way can we hold um, 
the uh, the responsibility for the killing of Christ to all the Jews at that time. Obviously, people like Caiaphas had some responsibility, right? But not all the Jews at that time, and most certainly not all Jews today or any Jews today. And, and it goes on to say that um, although the church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God, as if this followed from Holy Scripture. Yeah. Mario, thoughts on that? Well, um, good morning. Uh, good morning, Mario. Professor, how are you doing? Um, uh, now, if uh, that is the teaching of Nostra Etate, um, I heard this uh, objection uh, sometimes, and I want to hear what you have to say about that. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. The, yes, the, indeed. The, the, right. The, the objection is the following. When we pray together um, to the God of Abraham, uh, Christian and Jews, uh, are we praying to the same God if uh, we Christian, when we pray, we pray to the, um, to the Trinity? Um, uh, but the Jews, uh, because they don't uh, believe in the incarnation, are we praying to the same God? And if we don't, uh, what are we doing there then? Right. And so I would answer, yes, we are. Um, emphatically, I would answer, yes, we're praying to the same God. What does it mean to speak of um, speaking to the same person? Right, so we, in just in human affairs, I think that analogy can help clarify this. We believe that we're speaking about the same person when we refer to the same individual who has the same history. Now, um, I may have a less perfect idea of the history of an individual and of the qualities and even of the identity of an individual than someone else. Right? So suppose we're talking about my dad. I, don't know, I would have a much better idea than, say, you would. Um, but we think we're talking about the same person, right? Even though I ha um, you may have an, a very imperfect knowledge of that same person. And I think that's what we would say here, that the well-catechized Christian has a better knowledge of the God of Abraham. But he doesn't have necessarily a better love, right? And so the um, members of the Jewish people may be speaking more intimately with the same God than we are, even though they don't know something theoretical about that God, that he um, fits what the councils described as um, um, the Trinity. Um, right? So um, even though they can't say certain theological affirmations that we can say, that doesn't mean they're not speaking to the same God and not putting us to shame by the intimacy and love with which they do so at times. All right? I think it's also... I think that question... Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. sorry. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Well, I think it's important to, to keep in mind, and so often there's a question with popular expressions. Uh, the term God doesn't pick out a genus. It's not like there's a group of gods and which god are you praying to. Right. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's just one god. <laughs> And, uh, I think the question is more difficult with regard to Islam, and that's because yeah. of the difference in the view of salvation history also. But that's precisely what we share with the Jewish people, right, is that um, shared faith about um, the expressed intention and revelation of God in all the books of the Old Testament and in the oral tradition of the Jewish people. Yeah, let, me, uh, let me turn now to uh, the Association of Hebrew Catholics. Mm -hmm. What is it? What, what's its work? Okay. What's its mission? All right, great question. Um, so the mission of the Association of Hebrew Catholics is to be a, um, a place in the church where Catholics um, of... Um, uh, Hebrew heritage, Jewish heritage, who still identify um, as being, um, in some profound sense, Jewish, 
because of what we just said. In other words, so this presupposes the teaching of Nostra Aetate, that um, the um, chosen people didn't get unchosen. In other words, that the election of the chosen people remains. So that poses a huge question. What does that mean today? Is there um, some role in salvation history for um, Jewish people who become Catholic? And is there any sense in maintaining that um, sense of Jewish identity in the church? And the Association of Hebrew Catholics answers yes, that there is very much um, a meaning um, to that. And that is something that hasn't been appreciated in the history of the church, right? due to all kinds of factors. Um, so let me just give a brief over. So in, in the first century, the apostolic age, we see that the, the apostles were all Jewish, our lady was Jewish. The, um, the first expansion of the, of the church um, showed the church as being from the circumcision and from the Gentiles together, built into one. But we could say it's part of the nature of the church, a mark of the church, that she be from the circumcision as well as from the Gentiles. And that that should be visible somehow. But that the Jewish presence in the church not um, um, involve a separation, a non-ability to, say, eat together and worship together, um, but um, to, so that in the church the church always be composed of Jew and Gentile um, brought into one by Christ. And then, so the Association of Hebrew Catholics seeks to, um, first and foremost, be a point of reference for Jews in the church who um, seek to um, find some way of, um, of maintaining their Jewish identity in full communion with the church um, and make some kind of bond um, with others who are in a similar right, with other Jews in the church. And in fact, most of the members of the association, though, are not Jews, and they would be simply Gentile Catholics who um, are, have a, an interest, a sympathy with, them, with those of um, Jewish heritage. Now, that last point is very interesting. Could you develop that a bit? When you were speaking, I was thinking, uh, for whatever reason, I was thinking initially of uh, Catholics with a Jewish background living in Israel. Ah. But in and fact, you're saying that the majority of the members of the Association of Hebrew Catholics are, are not living in Israel and don't have a Jewish background. Yeah. I mean, it's not the Association and wouldn't make sense if all of its members were non didn't have a Jewish background, right? So it, its purpose is to help to preserve Jewish identity within the church. But the fact is that when we do events, and people who come to the events, like I give a lecture series, things like that, are mostly um, um, simply Catholics who are deeply interested in the Jewish roots of the church, um, interested in typology, interested in, in discovering more about that and supporting um, a witness of Jews in the church. Um, even though they themselves are not. Um, and with regard to Israel, um, yes, it would be great if, um, if there were... Um, I mean, so there is, um, in Israel, there is mass celebrated, Catholic, um, the Catholic mass celebrated in Hebrew, um, but the association is much broader because we're, the fact is we're dispersed throughout the, all the world. Right? And so every part, in every diocese, I'm sure there are some... Um, Hebrew Catholics in the broad sense of um, Catholics from a, a Jewish heritage. Um, uh, so it's, not, uh, yeah. it's not directly, the Association of Hebrew Catholics is not directly ordered to um, proselytizing other Jews. In other words, it's not directly ordered to evangelizing Jews, but to um, helping Jews within the church, first and foremost. Help them to preserve their identity. Yeah, oh, an analogy could be. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yes, about that. But perhaps uh, uh, so our audience can understand, I think, better. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned a few times the word identity. What yeah. makes a Jew to be a Jew? 
But what are, if we could um, <laughs> describe the properties of that identity? Because to remind yeah. me something that is very common to those who study, let's say, uh, Latin America, what, ma what make a, a citizen to be a Latin American? Is there such a thing as an identity? Perhaps the analogy right. is not quite fair, but uh, it would be a very good to illustrate a little bit about that. Right. Yeah, so it comes from, I mean, the basic idea of identity is that all of our identity, every person has an identity that's not just purely individual, um, but that we're, a social, we're social beings, we're rooted in a people which has a history. And that's true of every human being. It's true of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ, um, so the Logos, becoming man, has to become man in a people. And God prepared for that for 2,000 years by calling Abraham, right, 2,000 years before the incarnation, so that to make a people in which um, the Logos, the Word, would become man. And you can see the people mattered greatly to Jesus, right, such that he, in effect, made this people, um, giving them the law, giving them the worship, um, the prophecies, um, so many saints, um, Romans 9.4 speaks about the glories of the chosen people. Actually, every human being has an identity that's also social and involves um, the history of one's own people. And that was true of Jesus, and that continues to be true of Jews after Jesus. But Jesus stands at the center of Jewish identity. I think that's a really important point. That if you look at... So Jews are different from other peoples in that Jews have their origin as a people from an act of God, directly a supernatural act, right? Whereas, the, I mean, sure, all other peoples come from an act of God, but we could say naturally. Um, whereas the Jewish people um, was chosen to um, be the people in which God would become incarnate. Um, and that, therefore, the calling of the Jewish people in some way as a whole is analogous to the calling of Our Lady. And so she, was, she had a very particular mission to be the mother of God. The Jewish people as a whole had the vocation to be the people in whom God would become man. And therefore they had a mission to point to him beforehand through their messianic hope. Still today, I would say, even though they're in invincible ignorance, um, through their continued hope in his coming, through their love of those scriptures that proclaimed his coming, through their sharing in the way of life that he wanted to partake of becoming man. Um, and then I would say still giving witness to God's own fidelity. So that was part of the, um, when we spoke before about the, um, the Nostra Aetate, and I said one of the key things is the Nostra Aetate said that the, it quoted Romans 11.29, that God's calling is irrevocable. Um, right, so that has to do with the faithfulness of God. Um, and so their calling is always, um, has, a, has to have a central reference to Christ. Right? They're the people with the messianic hope. And thus it seems that they continue to have that mission to point to him. Um, even if they're um, ignorant, usually through no fault of their own, but through fault of ours, through fault of anti-Semitism and things like that, and that that messianic hope, in fact, um, is realized by Jesus Christ. And, and I think they're also a witness today to the fact that, Jesus, that God remains faithful to his people and will bring them into the fullness of the truth um, in the proper time. Right? And that would be an aspect of what we mean by end times. But all through the centuries, Jews have come to recognize Christ. And it's just that in our time, that's happened with a greater, um, a greater pace and a greater social organization of those Jews who come to believe in Christ. Now, uh, so, I'm sorry, I've got to start on this question. with uh, uh, referencing <laughs> your use of the term identity. Uh -huh. And what you've said now certainly helps. Uh, I'd like to do a, okay, kind of long-winded... Okay. compare and contrast on this notion of identity. 
many years ago, uh, let's say 30 years ago, I began reading uh, a kind of regular report on the Jewish understanding, self-understanding of identity. Mm-hmm. And it was something carried out, I think, by a group of rabbis in California. I might have some of these details not quite right. But at the beginning, the respondents would say, well, to be a Jew, first of all, is to, to uh, hold the Jewish faith. Uh, but but there's some who said, no, it's a matter of culture. Now, over the past 30 years, those numbers have really flipped. A significant majority of Jews uh, participating in this uh, long-term study say, well, it's primarily a matter of culture. Some say it's primarily a matter of, of religious identity, but the majority have taken the cultural option now compare and contrast. There are a good many Catholics, and I think a representative grouping of them, who are members of the United States Senate and Congress, who uh, profess to be Catholics. And, and uh, well, I suspect that they are really cultural Catholics. Now, my sympathy for cultural Catholics is, uh, let's say, uh, a nuanced sympathy. Uh, I'm sympathetic that it's just devolved to a culture. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to challenge them. And I must say that when I think of uh, Jewish people and Jewish uh, intellectuals, and one that I follow very regularly is a uh, uh, Rabbi Litvak in, in First Things, I'm always drawn to the uh, uh, explanation of Jewish identity in terms of revelation and scripture. Uh, and I'm certainly drawn to a certain extent, that's not put very well, is it, to Jewish identity insofar as it reflects the ongoing agony of the experience of the Shoah yeah. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, this whole business about cultural identity versus religious identity is, is something that I'm always grappling with. Right. And maybe you have something to say about okay. that. Yeah, no, fantastic question. Um, so this is a complicated issue, Jewish identity, um, that Jews argue about, obviously, as you've just said. Um, so what I would say is that the right way to understand it, so that's a false dichotomy, cultural versus religious faith. And the better way to say it, to understand it, is what you mentioned at the end. It's um, revelation and, God, I would say, God's own action in electing. So Jewish identity is first and foremost being a member of a people that God um, chose. All right, now that right there, it's a common Jewish thing to say, and Lord, could you please choose somebody else? And and very many Jews, like my, so my dad was a Jewish atheist who didn't have a strong sense of Jewish identity, except through persecution. But nevertheless, Jewish identity isn't first and foremost, I think it's a mistake to think of it as a faith, because it's got to be first and foremost an act of God calling a people to prepare for his coming into the world and who still have a mission of pointing to his coming into the world. Right? And so being called um, then gives a responsibility to adhere to that revelation, right? to believe that revelation. But that's building on a prior action of God that would be inserting us into a people. So I it's neither culture nor faith that first and foremost, but um, the people itself. And now in the old covenant, there's a different way of becoming part of that people than in the new covenant, right? So the new covenant, the gateway is baptism. Um, whereas in the old covenant, the ordinary gateway is birth. 
prince, one's born into the people of the old covenant. And, and Jews recognize as Jews, atheist Jews. So my dad, as an atheist Jew, would be thought of by Orthodox rabbis as a bad Jew, and, but still a Jew. And the same thing would go with Jews who um, embrace Buddhism. I think my, that might be a Jew boo. Um, sorry. Um, uh, but still a Jew. This is right? as bad as mine. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Um, there is a problem, I'm though. I'm with... to bookstore Buddhists. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. Let's get but, back um, on track. No, I do have a very good friend who is a Jewish Buddhist uh, priest. Um, but um, still, obviously, regarded as Jewish. The problem comes, though, when Jews get baptized. Um, and that's because the Jewish, that's a whole other issue that I hope we have time to talk about, that um, Christianity has obviously presented a huge threat to Jewish identity over the centuries um, in a way that other, and so baptism is regarded by many Jews as apostasy, right, by Orthodox. And in some way, though, it doesn't entirely take away Jewish identity because you're now an apostate Jew, but still there's something there um, that even that apostasy doesn't take away. Um, and that is being a member of, being, having been born into that people. Now, obviously, one can also become a Jew by conversion, um, but that's not the ordinary way. Um, Mario, reflections so, on these reflections. Yeah, uh, so when you said the last, the last uh, sentence, you said, well, what about someone who is a uh, Christian or is a uh, an agnostic and become a Jew. Is that possible? Um, but according to what I heard, that's not uh, possible. To become, in other uh, words, to go through the rite of conversion, not believing right. in the revelation? No, that what wouldn't make you, sense. What, what about if you do believe and become a believer of the old covenant and want to become Jew? So Are you... What, what? What I'm saying is that talking about identity, can we, uh -huh. um, can we get in that identity by becoming Jews uh, sincerely? In other words, uh, you say, well, then this is the old covenant. I believe in that. I come in from the Gentile world. And so is that possible to acquire that identity by uh, moving toward that, um, uh, that faith? Yes. Yeah, so in script, we see this in Scripture. There were the proselytes. So there were, we see two groups in the New Testament of Gentiles who approach um, the, the people of the Old Covenant. And many of those who came to believe in the God of Israel but didn't get circumcised, and they were the, the God-fearing, and then others who got circumcised. And so that would be the rite of conversion by which a former Gentile becomes a member of the Jewish people. So if you're a man... That involves being circumcised and taking a ritual bath, um, which is very much like baptism, um, and in fact the precursor of baptism. That's a whole other issue in itself. And if you're a woman, simply that um, that ritual um, um, called tevila or baptism and a profession of faith. So yes, that can happen, um, and those are would be Jews in the in the full sense as having been incorporated into the people, not by birth, but by the right of conversion. I'm not sure, is that what you are? And, yeah. and so they too yeah. would have, and their children then, would have Jewish identity as well. And now it's the case of, um, of Ruth, right? So being of a Moabite family, being incorporated into Jewish people, and becoming the, um, um, the ancestor of King David and the bus of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, can you tell Jewish, us, me, uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, ahead. Jewish identity can be understood in part, so going back to your original question, by um, an analogy with that of any national identity, right? So it's by so it's American identity, um, Latin American identity, whatever it may be, German identity. Um, and part of the beauty of the Catholic Church is that um, the identity, we could say the civil, social, ethnic identity of all the different peoples of the world find a place in the Catholic Church without having to renounce that national identity, right? 
So that's part of the beauty of the Catholic Church is that there are Polish Catholics and Greek Catholics and all the rest, and American Catholics. And, but what about Jewish Catholics? Right? That's always been a difficulty. So that's a whole other question about Jewish identity. Does that identity go away, unlike other identities of people, when one becomes Catholic, or does it remain? Well, according to the analysis we've just built up, it ought to remain. And in fact, I would argue, it not only ought it to remain, but it ought to have a special theological significance in the church as being the people um, to whom the Messiah was first promised and to whom it was promised that he would redeem them, right? Um, redeem the Jewish people um, in redeeming the world. Um, but what this Jewish identity looks like inside the church, that's a, a matter of, of continued discussion. But now the association of Hebrew Catholics is is something very different from what are referred to as Messianic Jews. Right. And so here's a huge difference of opinion of what about what Jewish identity means and looks like for those who believe in Jesus as the Messiah. So Messianic Jews is a kind of generic name for um, uh, various groups of um, Jews who have come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, but who haven't found their way into the Catholic Church. And so they tend, to, so it's, it's hard to speak of them as a whole because you'll find lots of different types of Messianic Jews. But we could say an initial difference between Messianic Jews and Hebrew Catholics is that Hebrew Catholics are Catholic and Messianic Jews um, are not. But in addition, there is a, um, a very large difference about how they um, worship um, um, liturgically and um, the whole role of the, um, we could say, the ceremonial law of the Old Covenant in the life of the Jew who has come to believe in Christ. Um, so Messianic Jews, so I don't know the history of this as well as I should, but um, Messianic Jews have the, um, are motivated greatly by um, a very strong sense of identification with the Jewish people, and therefore um, that gets translated in liturgical terms in the fact that their worship um, continues to be largely based on the worship of the synagogue. Right? And so they'll typically Messianic Jewish congregations observe a Sabbath um, service that involves the same um, liturgical readings as in um, Jewish worship in general. Uh, in other words, non-Messianic Jewish worship. Whereas obviously Hebrew Catholics would follow the, um, the you know, Catholic liturgical cycle and the liturgical year would center on Easter and, and, and so forth and Sunday. Um, so now, closely related to that, uh, within the association uh, of Hebrew Catholics, it, that there are some who s s continue to practice uh, right. distinctive uh, forms of, uh, mm -hmm. what should I say, distinctive forms of prayer associated with Judaism. Right. So going back to, so let me, in answering that, I'd just like to say something about going back to Jewish identity. Um, Jews who come to believe in Christ very often have had very different backgrounds in their own families growing up. Right? So I think I was somewhat of a special case in that I got no Jewish prayer growing up because my dad was a Jewish atheist and, and my mom was actually a fallen away Protestant. So I wouldn't even be re regarded by Orthodox Jews as, as properly Jewish. And so I didn't get any of that growing up. Whereas other um, Hebrew Catholics grew up in very devout um, Jewish families and thus lived um, with a, um, you know, a kind of natural um, sense of Jewish prayer. And so the members of the Association of Hebrew Catholics, just like in general um, Catholics from a Jewish, um, who, um, who are Jews, and, and have very different um, experiences of Jewish prayer that they would then bring. Um, and so one of the things that differentiates Hebrew Catholics, say, from Messianic Jews, is that in Messianic Judaism, there's often this sense that, um, often, not always, that there's this, an obligation to continue to practice um, what we call the ceremonial law of Moses. So let me make here a little parenthesis. Um, Thomas Aquinas 
makes a distinction of three parts of the Torah. Um, there's the moral law, which obviously is con- summed up in the Ten Commandments, continues to be binding on Catholics as well as Jews and all human beings. There's the ceremonial law, which involves liturgical worship um, and the prayer, and things like um, rules with regard to eating, because that also is in some way has a religious dimension in the, in the Jewish context. That would be what we call kosher laws. Um, and then there's a third part, judicial precepts. So here basically what we're focusing on is that second part, the ceremonial, liturgical, um, life of prayer as well as dietary, um, laws keeping kosher, other laws of family purity and so forth. Um, and the question is, um, so a first answer is that can't be understood to be mandatory in the Catholic Church. And that's part of um, our understanding of St. Paul's teaching that um, in the New Covenant, the ceremonial law of the Old Covenant no longer um, has the same obligatory um, force. And that's because um, the liturgical life of the New Covenant has to center on Christ. So that's kind of the first thing. Um, but um, that there could be voluntary expressions, not mandatory, um, that involve um, the liturgy of the Old Covenant, that is in itself a very disputed point, but I think a very important one. And the answer there would be yes. Um, members of the Association of Hebrew Catholics um, do things that come from the Old Covenant. And a key one, the, maybe the most obvious, would be um, the Seder, the Passover Seder. Um, and so the Association of Hebrew Catholics, if you go to their website, um, you can download a, um, a, a Hebrew Catholic Seder. And so it would be simply the order of the Passover meal, but different than, say, the, I don't know, the ordinary Jewish one. And it points out the way, different ways that Jesus has fulfilled the Passover. Um, and so I think that's part of the mission of the Association of Hebrew Catholics is to for its members to have a greater familiarity with the, um, the worship of the Jewish people and to be able to point to the presence of Christ in that liturgy, how it's not, you know, it's integral. It's in, very often implicit, sometimes more explicit, um, but it's all pointing to Christ. Um, and so celebrating, so here, just give my personal history on this. Um, growing up, um, I would celebrate the Passover Seder as a, an atheist with my family, and it was never a deeply religious experience because of the lack of faith. Um, I came to experience um, a Passover Seder in a profound way for the first time um, as a Hebrew Catholic. Um, in 2006, um, the president of the Association of Hebrew Catholics, David Moss, and his wife moved to St. Louis, and um, where I live, and so we were able to celebrate a Passover Seder together, and we invited the then Archbishop of St. Louis, um, which is Cardinal Burke, um, to share the Seder with us. And it was a magnificent experience, totally different, because we could see it all centering on Christ, um, pointing to him and him being present in the center of it, and then to even point out where he would have said the words, this is my body, right? this is the chalice of my blood. And so that would be, I think, the most obvious and, and beautiful example of how um, Hebrew Catholics and can continue to make use of um, liturgical forms from the Old Covenant, but with a difference. In other words, not in exactly the same way, because enlivened, animated by faith in Christ and, um, and, and the ecclesial faith. Um, that must have been a powerful yeah. experience. My yeah, own. that was wonderful. We all, we all said that that was the most beautiful Passover Seder that we had ever experienced. Um, and so... Uh, other, so that would be the most, kind of the most obvious. Other examples would be other Jewish feasts. That, um, so um, uh, Pentecost corresponds even um, in, so that, the closest correspondence after Passover would be the Feast of Pentecost because the first Christian Pentecost took place on the Jewish Pentecost. And there's a beautiful shared meaning, the Jewish Pentecost um, expressing and uh, memorializing the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, and Christian Pentecost, and memorializing the giving of the Holy Spirit as the new law of Christ. In other words, not a new content, but the power of love by which to live the old law of the, the double commandment of love and to put it in practice. And, and then secondly, the, 
the old Jewish Pentecost had the idea of first fruits. One brought the first fruits of one's harvest um, to the temple. And um, the Christian Pentecost celebrates the first fruits of the church's harvest um, of conversion and, um, and holiness and uh, evangelization. Um, another place where um, Hebrew Catholics can express liturgical devotion is um, in the fall, the, um, the various um, Jewish um, feasts, um, starting with um, Rosh Hashanah, the, the beginning of the Jewish year, um, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and then five days later, the, um, the Feast of Sukkot, or booths or tabernacles, it's often called in English. Um, and so in the traditional way to celebrate that as a Jew is to have build a hut um, with um, willow with branches over as the roof outside in your backyard um, and to have one's meals in this, remembering the 40 years of wandering in the desert in which Israel had a unique intimacy with the Lord um, in that wandering, moved by his spirit, moved by um, the, the pillar of cloud and fire, um, and then looking forward to eternal tabernacles. And so this, again, has beautiful messianic implications and ecclesial, and it can be celebrated in some way. Um, obviously, again, not the same. So I think that's an important point, that when Hebrew Catholics um, make use of liturgical forms from the Law of Moses, they're, not, they're doing so with, in the light of um, Christian faith, um, and a Christian faith that sees the beautiful typology um, and preparations in the prayer of Israel. Uh, Ariel, uh, could you comment on some of these uh, illustrations? Well, um, well, but I'm curious about something. Uh, what about Havura? I don't know okay. if I pronounce well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Havura. I mean, it depends mm -hmm. where you put the... In the modern Hebrew, it would be Havura. And so that right. just means that a fraternity, literally. Right. Um, and we can see that was something in the present in the New Testament times that Jews would form fraternities of prayer in which to, um, similar to what we call maybe circles in um, Catholic um, or uh, in Christian, um, in other words, to have a, um, a smaller community in which one does a Bible study, in which one seeks to reinforce the faith and to worship together with others in an intentional way, to build discipleship. So in the, in the Jewish world, um, the name for that would be Havara, and the Association of Hebrew Catholics encourages um, so part of the problem is Hebrew Catholics tend to be dispersed, right? And we tend to think we're the only one who's, and we're not. And so it's good for Hebrew Catholics to get together with non-Hebrew, in other words, with regular Catholics who are Gentile Catholics, but who are interested in that, to um, again, to explore aspects of faith together. Um, so yeah, the Association of Hebrew Catholics has encouraged the formation of groups like that um, to study together and to pray together. So if you have some practices and you are dispersed, is there any possibility in the future that you foresee a time when uh, an ord personal ordin ordinariate for Hebrew Catholic can be created? Yeah, I think that would be, again, um, it's important that the Holy Spirit be the one in charge, right? So and the Holy Spirit um, works in in God's time and not in our time. But yes, I do believe that that would be, um, at least to my reason, a providential um, thing. And let me say why. Um, and, well, it, so the ordinary organization of the um, Catholic Church is territorial, right? And so we have um, dioceses that are organized territorially. I live in St. Louis, the Archdiocese. Um, but there is in the church another possibility and that would be a personal rather than territorial principle mm -hmm. of diocesan organization as it were um, and that makes sense with regard to Hebrew Catholics precisely because of the dispersion but a more basic question is why should there be any um, should there be in fact any um, um, ecclesial organization that corresponds to Hebrew Catholics and in the past there simply wasn't and that was um, part of well, might be called the regime of assimilation. So in the past, so from the second century until the 20th, the general 
tendency of Jews who became Catholic was simply to totally assimilate into a Gentile Catholic world. Um, and so the, there was no need for um, an association or a personal or narrative or anything of the kind. But there was a tragic loss, though, as a result. And that loss was that Jews who became Catholics um, in practice had to renounce all of those practices. So they're never, and not only, so for example, we were talking about a Hebrew Catholic Seder, Passover Seder. In, in past centuries, um, that was generally thought to be um, gravely sinful, to continue to worship in a Jewish way as Catholics. And so there was a regime of total assimilation in which the different aspects of their peoplehood um, in terms of prayer were not, didn't find a place in the church um, in a way that differed from what was the case with Gentiles now who became Catholic, who didn't have to renounce their, uh, their social or ethnic identity. All right, so given what we said about Vatican II at the beginning and a newfound sense that um, the election hasn't been um, abrogated, um, there are, in, we need to find a way to, um, to incorporate Jews into the church um, in such a way that there's support for Jewish identity. Um, and so that's why I think um, some, a structure like a personal ordinariate would be a good thing. So the, the example of that, the um, closest example, is the, um, with regard to the Anglicans. And so Pope Benedict um, recognized a, um, an ecclesial structure um, with a personal organi organization for Anglicans who became Catholic, um, not simply as individuals, but often with their parish, etc., cetera, um, and wanted to um, continue a way of worship that would respect their history um, as um, of Anglican origin. And so it seems, again, with even more reason, something like that would make sense for Hebrew Catholics. Um, the problem, though, is, again, we're dispersed and have such a variety of histories um, in terms of um, Jewish prayer. That makes it more difficult. Uh, but yeah, I do think that would be um, uh, a providential um, I want to uh, turn the page here, and it's a page I turn with with regret. Uh, the question of anti-Semitism, and mm. I'm going to do it in a personal experience sort of way. Um, for many a moon, I taught at a Catholic university, and uh, the Christmas crash that was regularly put up during the, the Christmas season uh, in more recent years was regularly vandalized and the uh, is it the feast of the uh, of the tabernacles the Sukkoth? Uh the 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 Jewish students on campus would put one of those up, and it was regularly vandalized. Mm. Now, this is in California, and I think California has a higher uh, higher number of idiots than most places. <laughs> and I, I, from I, think, for that question. I think a good deal of religious vandalism is fueled by simple idiocy. Uh, however, however, uh, there's uh, much, much, much worse uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Catholicism as well. I've recently read accounts that, that suggest that if you want to live a, 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 Jew, a Jewish life in France, you, you'd better consider the possibilities of doing so, that it might be better just to live in some other country. And I take this to be uh, an extraordinary outrage. Right. And I, yeah. I'm wondering, uh, is there any way that the uh, Association of Hebrew Catholics can bring a special dimension to the, the seemingly 
endless struggle uh, against anti-Semitism? Yeah, no, great question. Um, it's not so. It's not the direct aim of the association, but it's certainly um, uh, an important part of the association's mission is to show love for the Jewish people, right? And so you can think of instead of anti-Semitism, philo-Semitism. And so maybe the kind of the the key scriptural text for that might be Romans nine verse four, where Saint Paul speaks about the uh, the glories of the Jewish people. Um, it's at the, in the chapter where he's speaking about his heartbreak over the fact that many of his brothers and sisters um, haven't come to recognize Christ. And so he says, I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren. They are Israelites. To them belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And of their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. And, and so that would be um, having that sense of the glory of Jewish election is a much, much needed antidote to the tragic 2,000 year history of, um, of Christian anti Semitism, right? Which is, yeah, this is one of the major stains on the history of the church. Um, and that would be, take us too far abroad to go into that, but the, obviously culminating in the Shoah, the Holocaust. Um, and so, yes, I think the association has to help contribute to, um, to forming a love for the Jewish people um, in, in, in their, um, their peoplehood and way of worship, um, also insofar as it hasn't yet come to recognize Christ. In other words, to see the beauty and in um, that Jewish identity as it's evolved um, in the past 2,000 years as well, in other words, rabbinical Judaism, and to have a greater familiarity than your average Catholic with some of the, you know, the spiritual treasures of rabbinical Judaism. Now, I wish I knew more about that myself, but, um, but yes, being an association gives me an impetus to, um, to come to love um, that, that Jewish heritage and to show its, um, yeah, its complementarity with um, the spiritual treasures of the fathers of the church, etc. Um, Mario, have you noticed any differences uh, in manifestations of anti-Semitism in the Latin American world uh, in contrast, say, to in Europe or North America? Interesting question. Um, in some ways, I do. Um, if um, you read carefully, many, even theologians uh, and philosophers in the 1940s, 50s, even today, who are leaning to a view of the church more um, toward what uh, then was called the old Christendom. The view of the Jews is quite negative. Right. And so the anti-Semitism is still there. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate. And so anyone who advanced, quote-unquote, an idea of the church more open toward what we may call the new Christendom or more... Um, embrace all the traditions and so on. Uh, that view is uh, not there, but still um, there is uh, such a thing, a tendency toward um, anti-Semitism, which I, at least my experience, has not been that experience in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps be because of the pluralism of uh, uh, liberal republic and all that. So Latin America was more uh, compact. There was a, a certain unity was coming from the the Reformation. It's a, a lot of uh, issues there. Even the concept of cultural Catholic has a different meaning uh, as here. Um, cultural Catholic means those who not only believe in uh, the dogma of the faith or live by the moral of the church, but also build a city according to the Catholic tradition. It's a Catholic city. 
And so that's the true uh, Catholic, uh, a cultural Catholic. The other are liberals or so. And so there has been, uh, I think there's still a difference. And, and you have in Argentina, for instance, the, 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 the bombing of uh, uh, 1991, which is still unsolved, of a, a Jewish center who killed a, a, a lot of people there. And in the midst of that, there are a lot of politics involved, but uh, that was a demonstration of a very high level of anti-Semitism. Mm. Sobering, sobering. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I want to just uh, say sure. one thing there. Go, go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, I think that in the Catholic world, the Second Vatican Council, I mean, really had a, a good fruit in that regard. So going back to it, the initial question, no state and especially compared to the you know the decade, of the 1930s and, and 40s. Um, but it's something that we always have to continue. And I think there can be a danger among traditionalist Catholics who aren't so fond of the Second Vatican Council um, mm-hmm. to um, yeah. Yeah. miss some of yeah of this, and that 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 can be dangerous. Oh, wait, wait, there's so many things going on. Let let me just uh, add in here a statistic. I I had mentioned. France just a short time ago, and I'm always interested in what's going on in France, in part because I'm always interested in Jacques and Raisa Maritain Uh and their work and in their legacy. Um, RNS, the Religious News Service, has just uh, posted a piece that, that has the following statistics. Catholics make up 41% of the French population, but the number of practicing Catholics is as low as 5%. Mm. And attacks on Christians have been on the rise in recent years. In 2019, there were 1,052 anti-Christian hate crimes in France, which is almost twice the amount of cases of anti-Semitism and 10 times the number of anti-Muslim acts. Now, I always look at statistics as, well, there's something going on there, and you'd have to look at things Mm -hmm. case by case. But we have this profound uh, secularization. And I wonder, we're getting close to the end of the hour. The the question I I, want to ask uh, um, uh, Professor Feingold is this. How can Catholics and Jews, in a time of secularization, how can we best witness to one another? Yeah, great, fantastic question. Um, The fact is that um, a practicing, believing, um, devout Catholic and a practicing, believing, devout Orthodox Jew have a tremendous amount in common. I mean, and, and we can give witness to our shared faith as well as to um, what comes out from that, um, such as work, um, pro-life movement, and, and things of the sort. Um, I found this, I had a beautiful experience of this. Um, after, um, so I, my wife and I became Catholic when we were 29 um, and entered the church. And um, after our conversion, it was then that I rediscovered my Jewish heritage. In other words, that I had never really known about growing up. And so I kind of fell in love with um, the aspects of that Jewish heritage, as well as obviously the, the fullness of the Catholic. And so I got together with a, high, a college friend who um, had been agnostic at college, but had become an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. And so we got together and we had a fantastic dialogue um, of sharing um, our faith. So we had a meal in, orth- in his house and um, just the, I mean, the Jewish prayers, the speaking about God during the meal the way they raised their kids, so similar to a Catholic family in, in many respects. I mean, there's very much that we can witness to one another um, if we do it in, in the right spirit, right? The spirit of respect for um, the complementary traditions, which doesn't involve any kind of relativism. Quite the, That would destroy it. Um, and so, yes, I think there's a great um, um, need in, in our world for 
um, devout Catholics and um, and Jews to work together and to to pray together and to speak about um, um, what we don't have in common, um, but in this way of introducing a treasure to the other um, and of respecting great their ability to not um, embrace it. Yes. Mario, uh, some some final thoughts from you on all of this discussion. Well, I think the the last uh, the last phrase of Professor Feingold is very beautiful. Introduce a treasure to one another, and I think one of the one of the our crisis now is we don't know how to dialogue, how to talk one another. Uh, we discuss, we just argue about things, and we don't listen to one another. So mm-hmm. it seems that we are behaving not as a human person where we have our own stories, and we need to give space to other people to propose what they have been living and vice versa. So instead of uh, engaging in a dialogue, we are just discussing, debating. So th- that sense, I think I have some kind of negative view about certain type of apologetic try to somehow impose some belief on others instead of listen, engage in an rich dialogue and let the Holy Spirit uh, do his work. I think that's, I think it's a very uh, powerful <coughs> statement about our democracy, I think, or lack of uh, true tolerance, I think. Amen to that. Now, we're once again at the end of the hour, and as always, I'd like to read the gospel from today's liturgy. This is from the gospel according to John. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother, Lazarus, who had died. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And anyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you very much, Professor Feingold, and thank you as always, Mario. Thank we'll be back next week. Okay, thank, thank you so you much, very much for inviting me. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. To a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.